My name is Father Michael Leitner. Basically, I was uh, born into a family of uh, 11 children. In that, four were miscarried, one died at birth, so I had five brothers and sisters that were alive. I was the youngest of 11, but the youngest of six living. And we were spoon-fed our Catholicism. My mom was a daily communicant, also a tour guide in Medjugorje. When I got into college, my whole aspect of uh, faith changed, and that's what you're going to hear about today. As I was going through high school, I was in eighth grade, I was uh, 6'4", 286 pounds. I got a lot of attention from the football. What was important to me in my life at that point was my friends, my family, having fun and playing sports. Uh, school really didn't register. I, I did school because I wanted to play sports and I had to keep my grades up and things like that. But in uh, 1991, I graduated from high school. I had about seven scholarship offers to play football at Division I universities. I chose Eastern Michigan University because they're one of the top five art programs in the nation. First time in my life, I was alone. I didn't have support of my family. My group of friends were not there. And I started to struggle and get lonely in college, even though I had new friends and people around me. So I started turning to alcohol and, and some drug use, and looking for companionship, chasing girls, as most young guys do in college. I started using marijuana and different things like that and met a girl I fell in love with. We dated for about four months and she broke up with me and it broke my heart. And that's where I started a downward spi spiral in college. Professional concert security, where I was beating people up for a living and getting paid for it. I loved it, worked on concerts like Metallica and Nine Inch Nails and Suicidal Tendencies and the big ones like Pink Floyd and the Rolling Stones and different things like that. Making a lot of money and, and doing a lot of stuff like that as well. My football career was going in the right path too. My, my dream as a child was to play professional football. My third year in college, which is my red shirt sophomore year as the sports years go on. And I brought some marijuana home one Thanksgiving. And what happened is my niece who was about four at the time was looking for a pencil in my hip sack or other people call it fanny packs. I, I don't use that term. It was a hip sack. And basically what happened is I slid it underneath the couch and I went to sleep that night. And because all my family was there, there wasn't a lot of room to stay. So I, when somebody got up, I went from the living room floor to the bed of my parents and I went back to sleep. I was up pretty late that morning and um, my mom came in and she was holding this bag of marijuana that my niece went to her and said, Grandma, what is this? Holding a bag of marijuana. And my mom confronted me along with my oldest sister who was a drug counselor at the VA hospital at that point. My sister was kind of teasing me from the end of the bed and she said, now you got to go to Medjugorje. But none of us really believed in Medjugorje. My mom had been there some 30 times and we were you know, we would kind of make fun of her. We'd harass her a little bit. She came and talked about all these miracles and all these different things that she had seen. It really wasn't real to us. So I was the first one in my family to go with my mother who dragged me along that December kind of by force uh, and not by choice. So I was on my first trip to Medjugorje, Bosnia, Herzegovina at that point, And it was an unbelievable experience that I, I received a certain grace, a singular grace from God.
basically I said the first real prayer in my life. And it was this prayer. Lord, if you exist, I don't know you. You could be the biggest con that 12 drunk men started 2,000 years ago. I haven't seen you. I haven't heard you. I haven't felt you. You got seven days to prove to me that you exist. Otherwise, I'm living my life my way. And that was my prayer in Medjugorje. First real prayer from my heart. And as I confessed my sins for 20, 25 minutes, I finally heard him say to me the words of absolution, but he gave me some advice first. But during the words of absolution, I felt a presence in the confessional with me. And what happened was, is I was kneeling at the grate, if this is my upper torso, when he said the words of absolution, my body started to fall like this, and I was in a double hurdler stretch where my legs were pinned underneath my body, and I couldn't move. My shoulders and my back were pinned against the back of the confessional, and it scared me because I was paralyzed, and he was in the words of absolution. And then when he said, I absolve you from your sins in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I felt this pain surge through my sternum. It almost felt, and it did feel like a dagger. I mean, it was powerful. But as it was pulled out and released, I felt all my anger, all my pain, all, my, all the depression, every wound that I've ever felt in my heart, I felt it leave me at that point. And for the first time in my life, I was truly free. That was the point of my conversion. I went to mass that day, but there was this priest, special priest, he's a friend of mine to this day, his name is Father Stan Fortuna, and he was preaching from the pulpit. And I said, well, this guy's pretty cool. Lord, let me hear what he has to say. Now I'm talking to the Lord like he's my best friend in my head. It just changed my relationship that quick. So at that point, he was speaking and I opened up my heart to him. Let me open my heart to what this priest has to say. And I was hit with something that I can only explain to you as Pentecost. It was better than any drug. It was better than winning the big game. It was better than sex. It was better than all these things put together times infinity. And finally, I opened my eyes. I was right there. I went to receive communion. And as I was walking out of the church, there was an Italian woman who looked at me and recognized something. I don't know what it was. She must have saw that I had an experience or something. But there was an Italian kid with me. He was, his name was Ryan. And she walked up to me. She goes, Benedictio, Benedictio, Benedictio. And I didn't know what she was saying. And I said, Ryan, what's she saying? He says, she wants a blessing. So I've seen this thing, you know, people bless people. So I grabbed her by the head, by the melon right here. And I said this prayer, I said, St. Michael, pierce her heart, fill it with love, joy, and peace, and take away the temptations, torments, and trials of the devil away from her. And I actually felt for the first time, God, the Holy Spirit come through my hand. And all of a sudden she was, boom, she was down on the deck. She was laying down. She fell in the Holy Spirit. And it scared me so much that I said, Ryan, let's get the hell out of here. And we left because I didn't want to deal with this. I didn't know what was going on to me. And I was scared because I was a 20-year-old college football player. My life took a progression after that. And every six months, my mom brought me to Medjugorje. She wanted to secure my conversion, which I'm, praise God, she did. Six months later, I was in Soroki Brig in Medjugorje, that aspect again, that, that territory. Soroki Brig is a Franciscan monastery. Father Yozo, a friend of mine um, who was a priest there at the time, he was the original priest at Medjugorje when the visions happened, was giving a testimony. And he would pray over all the priests, and all the priests would come and pray over all the people. So I was catching for this one priest in particular. The Spirit of God was moving through him in power, where people were having healings and falling in the Spirit, and I was catching them. It was a fun thing to do. It was kind of a veteran of Medjugorje thing to do. But he came to this woman in a wheelchair, and because I was with that priest, her husband came up to me and said, my wife had a car accident seven years ago and her spinal cord was separated. She had atrophy in her legs so bad that literally her thighs were about the size of my forearm. She was about 140, 145 pounds. There was no way that she could support the weight that she was carrying. So this priest was down on her knees and it was kind of a break for me from catching. And he was 
laying hands on her knees and her ankles and her, her hips and her calves and blessing everything. And I'm thinking to myself, this woman is not going to walk. It's medically impossible. All of a sudden I heard a voice in the back of the head, Michael, if I get her out of the wheelchair, will you enter the seminary? And I knew right away it was God. And I said immediately, I said, no way, no, no. For 20 minutes I sat there thinking about what was said to me and I was sitting there praying for her. And I said, okay, Lord, if you get her out of this wheelchair and walk her around the entire church, this, this huge monastery, I will know it's you and I will go to the seminary. And within five seconds, she was up on her feet and she started to walk around the church, pushing her own wheelchair. The voices in my head were like, stop her. <laughs> they were like screaming in my head, somebody tackle her. I, I didn't want to become a priest, I, you know. And finally, she turned the corner, the first corner, the second corner, the third corner, and finally she's coming around the third side, you know, of the long church. And I changed the deal on God. I said, if she doesn't step on that slate block, I said, I'm not, I'm not going. Well, wouldn't it God have it that way that she put her first foot on that block and her second foot, and she stopped on that very block and sat down in her wheelchair. And I said, some very explicit words to our Lord in the tabernacle. Looked right at him and I walked out. I was angry. It felt like I was duped. And I went outside and a friend of mine was watching the miracle of the sun and we sat there and tears running down our eyes. We both decided to go to the seminary at that point. My ordination day was a very special day for me. It was, it's, it's like a wedding. People were praying uh, the litany of the saints. And all I kept on praying is, Lord, I'm not worthy, and Lord, have mercy on me. And it kept on going through my mind and to realize that we are, as humans, we are so unworthy of the sacred priesthood that we actually stand in Persani Chrissy Capitut, which means in the person of Christ, the head. And in that, thinking about it just scares you as a, a seminarian and even a deacon moving to a priesthood and, and to be able to offer sacrifice at the altar. And the reason it scares you is because it's a lot of responsibility. It's a responsibility that you will only receive when you're judged by God. So I gotta be honest, at my ordination, there was a fear of God. And I realized that, you know, they say in scripture, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And in that, I, I just kept on asking for God's mercy through the ceremony. But I remember one thing after I was ordained a priest, and it was the joy. The joy to be able to give the love that I was given in the confessional in Medjugorje in 1994 that I could give that to people, that I could share that with people. And that was my biggest drive towards priesthood. Father, you are so relatable to a lot of people. For the uh, adult men, you love deer hunting, duck hunting, and fishing. And for the youth, because of your NFL background, your sports background, I mean, your physical presence is quite intimidating if they see you, but then they see that gentleness in you. And also for the women to see that gentle side of uh, surrender to the Lord by being in the arts, you have a, a degree in fine arts, so you're into sculpture and painting. God has used that powerfully in your ministry. I look at when you give up your life for God, you know, I gave up the National Football League to become a priest. I, I came kicking and screaming. Believe me, that was not an easy journey, and God kept on giving me signs and wonders on the way to bring me to fulfill that. But within that, when you do surrender to him, you surrender everything. 
You can't surrender 75%. You've got to surrender everything. And what it's allowed me to do is, even with hunting and fishing and different things like that, it's allowed me to bring it to the Lord. That's a time of prayer for me. Painting and doing sculpting is a time of prayer for me. Mm -hmm. Also, I love riding motorcycles. I, I, I started a group, founded a group called Sons of Mercy, which is dedicated to the Divine Mercy Chaplet. So it's taking things that I love to do and giving them back to God and trying to spread the gospel with those things, I think are very important. The art part of it, I think, is more the intimacy with God. Your message to a lot of your uh, parishioners is the love of the Father. And you want that known through the different ministries that you promote here in your church. You're the administrator of three churches. How has that been for you, spreading the love of God? Well, ultimately, I think it, you know, it starts with me, how I come across, how the homilies are, how the liturgy is. It all starts right there because that's where we gather. And then it's meeting people where they're at. You know, if they're struggling with something, if you get dirty in a sense and you go down to the struggle and, and embrace that with them, you know, joy and they're having a baby baptism, you revel in that joy and you congratulate and you love. You try to meet people where, where they're at and be with them. And the people of God appreciate that. They, they love that. We get the benefit as, as priests to be with people in the most sacred moments of their lives, baptisms, weddings, funerals, tragedies, all sorts of things. And they let us in because, because of who we are and what we've given up. But it's an honor to be there for them and to you know, bring whatever gifts that we have in this life to gift them, you know, with the sacraments and the grace of God as well. People struggle with prayer life. Sometimes they're like, I don't have time, or they might have time, but they don't know what to say. Share with us your prayer life and how that could actually inspire a lot of people watching us right now. I talk to God from the moment I get up in the morning till when I fall asleep. As soon as my feet get hit the ground in the morning, I, I try to honor the Father. And I don't do anything special. Obviously, there's the prayers of the church and the bravery and the rosary and, and the Divine Mercy Chaplet. And those are things that I do when I have idle time. Like if I'm sitting in the confessional alone, I'm always praying a Divine Mercy Chaplet. If I'm on the road, I'm trying to pray a rosary when I'm driving. Um, but I'm always constantly talking to God. I think I ask Him a lot, you know. I ask the Father for him to pour out his love onto my congregation. I pray for everyone who asks me to pray for them. Constantly getting text messages from around the country, asking for prayer, even on Facebook and, and different multi or, uh, social media outlets. I, I bring that prayer to, to mind. But the thing is, is I think because of my experience, the mystical aspect of my experience in the confessional, I have an instant kind of, uh, connection. I open up and I, I talk to God like I would, like I'm talking to you. I don't think we have to put the thous and the theys and the, like the old English Bibles. All I think we need to do is open our heart and be honest with ourselves. And in our minds, we can talk to God from our heart very easily. So be honest with God. Be honest with yourself. And the thing is, is when you're honest with yourself, God will start to move in your life because you've humbled yourself in front of him. Father, with your busy schedule, um, you're the administrator of three uh, parishes here in Wisconsin. How do you unwind? How do you um, enjoy leisure activities? Well, I go out and I uh, run my dog. You know, I look at my younger life and I used to do wind sprints. And as I was running him this morning, I was like, okay, you're getting in shape for hunting so I don't have to pick up all the ducks. And, uh, he loves it. He's an 11-month-old puppy, and he's doing great. Uh, his name is Grizzly. But things like that, to get out hunting, to get out in the woods, you know, the hustle and bustle and all the things that are going on in a parish or in the world, you just step out in the wilderness for a while, and, and it calms you down, and you're at peace. Find nature. Find, you know, that even heal within your own heart. And, and let your heart come down to the surroundings you're in and you find that solitude that you need. It's a great place to pray to the woods. 
Sometimes I pray for a big buck and God doesn't answer, you know. <laughs> he sends me a little on her, her little dough. You have a deep devotion to our Blessed Mother because she played a pivotal part in your priesthood. How do you see your relationship with her at this present moment? Uh, she's my mama. Uh, I think that she is the key figure in, in our time in salvation history, and that's a big statement. I think that she's the woman of uh, Revelation, I think she's the woman of Genesis, and I think she's the woman in the Gospels. She will, Satan will strike at her heel and she will crush his head. She's my general that I take orders from. Obviously there's a hierarchy over her, but she's the one giving the orders and directing the troops and uh, all the respect in the world. And there's nothing like a mother's love. Thank you so much, Father, for letting us talk to you and share your profound insights about your priesthood and your service to the Lord and our Blessed Mother. Thank you. Vocation to me is a very important aspect of the faith. I think all people call to a vocation in God, either single life, uh, married life, or religious vocation. In my case, it was a religious vocation that was brought by a mystical experience. But I would encourage all of you to to seek your vocation in God. One of the great advice that I give to uh, college kids is when you walk into a church, dip your hand in the holy water and make the sign of the cross and then anoint your wedding finger and start praying for your spouse now because ultimately God knows who that spouse is, that perfect mate that was made for you. That may be the church, that may be service in the church, that may be God, you may be God's bride or in the person of Christ as a priest. So first of all, deepen your relationship with Jesus Christ. Get to know him, start talking to him. If we let all the things of the world filter into our mind, we will never hear the voice of God. So try to find some time for silence and peace. Get away in the woods, go out and do something that you love to do where you can be quiet and just ask God those questions you need to ask. And ultimately God will return the answer to your heart and to your mind and ask God what you can do for him. And he will give you the vocation that meets your wildest dreams. It may be marriage, it may be the single life, but it may be vocation to the priesthood, a consecrated life. He will lead you on your way and the Holy Spirit will fill your heart. So my brothers and sisters, I will pray for you. Have courage and God bless you. In Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. If you have good news, we expect you to want to share it. Salvation in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who for love of us and for our salvation came down from heaven. Salvation in His name, and He is the only Savior, is what we are on earth for. Therefore, all those who spread the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ, we should encourage them. I can speak, but how many people can I reach alone? But the media, the television people, the radio, the newspapers, and all those who use the computer and its derivatives in various ways to spread the gospel. We must thank them. We must encourage them. We must work with them so that they can continue to spread the good news. There is so much news that is not so wonderful in the world, but there is also news that is wonderful on the gospel of Jesus Christ. We encourage them and beg God to bless them especially the Shalom World TV. God bless you. Shalom World, God's own channel.